the opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily the opinions of the people on this program. It's time for the Three People Like This interview series. This week's guest is Chris Mazzilli. This is incredible. I'm sitting with Chris Mazzilli here at uh, Gotham Comedy Club, and it's extremely quiet. Really and I'm not used to it. <laughs> it's, like, it's usually roaring with laughter, ladies and gentlemen, here at Gotham Comedy Club. But Chris. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I mean, you were telling me about the history of this building, so I'm going to let you. It's, I mean, I have so many questions that I have swirling in my head. But talk to me about the building and what it was before. Yeah, so the short version of the story was we... When the club opened 21 years ago, we opened on 22nd Street, uh, 34th, 22nd Street, which is now Metropolitan Room, which is another space we're involved with. It's a music space. But we outgrew that space. And um, I, I was about 10 years in, 9 years in. We were selling out a lot of shows. And I was like, man, we've we got to get a bigger space. So at the time, I had a restaurant called Arezzo, A-R-E-Z-Z-O, which we were selling. We opened... August 2001, right. and 9-11 happened a month later. So Was it downtown? It was on actually 22nd between 5th and 6th. It was six. around here. Yeah. Right here. Okay. yeah, yeah. So the broker that I was using to sell that space said, hey, would you ever consider getting a bigger space for Gotham? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm thinking about that right now. And he said, oh, I know of a space on 23rd Street that's going to become available. It's not even on the market yet. The landlords are great guys. Uh, it's been a problem spot. It was a nightclub that had like a lot of shootings and stabbings, and they just want like a good really? tenant. Yeah. What was yeah. the name of the night, nightclub? It was a lot of different <coughs> places. I think it was Twilo or Twirl. Oh, okay. It was yeah. uh, Sessa, uh, <laughs> S-E-S-S-A. It was there. a Manhattan spot where people shot each other. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. So he said, you know, uh, do you have time to look at the space tomorrow? I said, yeah. So he actually brought me into the door behind you. The f so the door's to the main building. It was we're on the stage, by the way. So behind me is where that door was. Yeah, I love so being on the main stage at Gotham Comedy Live. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I walked in five feet into the space, and I looked in here, and it was, it was no longer than I closed. Everything was ripped out. There were wires hanging from the ceiling, which, by the way, if you see the ceiling is about 16 feet high. There's another probably 10 feet above this. Is there really? Yeah. So that, That's it, incredible. I know. I know. To find a space like with no pillars in Manhattan. So I walked in. And I said, I'll take it. And he goes, you haven't even seen this whole space yet. How I could said, you not say, you'd take I said, it? I can tell you right now. I'm not now. an idiot. I've been in the business for a long enough time. I'll I take said, this you don't find point. spaces like this? I said, yeah. I said, and it was interesting because uh, then he started telling me the history, you know, that it was formerly a church and a recording studio. Wow, and then I a church. Yeah. It was a Catholic church. I so said, Chad, that's why I'm sweating. That's I, why you, I don't feel You do look nervous. Nauseated. When was the last time you were in a church? Oh, definitely recently. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the longer history of the building was uh, apparently on this lot, there was a, a church, and the people who were going to want to buy the church and the lot to open a hotel called the Hotel Carteret. And uh, the people who were running the church at the time said, look, we'll sell you the property, but you have to put a church within the hotel. So that's where we are right now. So if you look like when you step outside the doors to the showroom right. to the right there there's like a brass uh, there's a brass railing there that's all original so downstairs like the rectory there's all like hidden like stairways so the, so part of the deal what year was that so part of the deal was you can buy this but you, you have you can be a hotel but you have to put a church in the hotel like 19, so i guess the catholic religion yeah. the diocese i guess that was like 1926 1927 <laughs> oh that's so funny so what is the, what the a hotel what a crazy sign of the times that is oh yeah he's a crazier sign so the hotel opened in 1929 Right. And the most expensive room was $4.95 a night. Wow, big baller. you got to be a yeah. baller to get that, that room. Isn't that crazy? Right? $4.95. That's not even a good tip yeah. for the valet guy now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you just made me feel cheap. Because <laughs> I only give the guy two bucks. Well, that's because you're, you know, yeah, yeah, obviously super not Jew. part of the diet. Super Jew. You can right. say super we're in public. He's super Jew, by the way. Oh, really? Super Jew. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's right. a well-earned name. Well, next I, time I, wear a cape so I know better. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get you your own super Jew cape. I'll man. take it. Um... 
Uh, yeah, listen. so I, you know, I walked in and I said, I love the space. And it was interesting because they basically wanted to make sure I was a legit guy. They came to the club a bunch of times, the, the origi you know, the uh, original location, to make sure that you know, we put on good shows and we were nice people. And, uh, and then finally they decided to give me the space. And, and you know, as <laughs> far as landlords go, the people that run this, this property really well, when, you when you said that, like I'm thinking to myself, only in Manhattan... Are they going to ask you for? I can only imagine the type of rent you're going to pay here. I, can, I, you know, I have, I have an idea, because I've, you know, dabbled in some restaurants. And when you look at a space like this, it's ridiculous amounts of money. So yep. the idea that they would ask you for whatever the rent is, and then have to approve you of the person that I'm going, that I'm allowing myself to take money from. Yeah, like that's a Manhattan thing. Yeah, you know? oh no, you're right. It's yeah. very much <laughs> yeah. Manhattan. Thing. It, it's like it's like you have to uh, come with seven years of paperwork and and finances to just to buy or rent an a, apartment. Yeah, right. No, that, no that type of thing. That's how. Listen, that's why if you look around the city now, there are so many vacancies because you know it's running a small business is hard. It's really, really. It it's is very, very difficult. Um, you know, and, and like a lot of mom and pop shops are gone. They are. You know, restaurants are struck. You know, and then you, you, your normal retail shops, like Amazon is demolishing everything. It's crushing. It's weird when you say that. We talk about that. Like, you know, what? I don't understand that. It's weird to me how we have so many people in this country that are sustaining themselves. Like, where's the money coming from? How did, you know, it used to yeah. be, used to be every industry had its people, you know. And now, like you said, Amazon. I mean, Amazon's getting into taking, you know, now they're getting into streaming where they're giving Netflix a run for their money. Yeah, where we thought Netflix was going to kill the movie industry, right? So what did they buy? They bought up... They bought Whole Foods. Up, they bought up Whole Foods. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I was just thinking, a few uh, doors down on 23rd Street, <laughs> there was like a supermarket, like a gourmet place um, called Garden of Eden. And within a short amount of time, Whole Foods opened and Trader Joe's opened. You know, two bigger chains and gone. Stores out. It's out. Of, it's out. Yeah. Take yeah, that's a strange thing that's going on here. And this essentially is a small business. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, if, you, if, from, if you're from out of town and you came to Gotham Comedy Club, you would think, wow, these, this is a big deal. I mean, it is a big deal. It's a really well-known, oh, popular, thanks. successful club. You're on Gotham Comedy Live on, uh, on uh, Access, Access TV. TV for how many years now? We did seven seasons. Yeah, it was, seven that seasons. was a great story because, um, well, first of all, Mark Cuban's a, a class guy. He, um, he is. It's, it's Mark Cuban Station. Yeah. He a millionaire it. Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah, uh, among TV. other things. And among other things. He's a great guy to deal with, isn't he? He's, yeah. He's, he's what he seems like on TV. That's well, him. what happened is, is there was a production company called um, Killer Bunny, and they had done another series with him. And I guess he said to them, hey, we're thinking about doing a comedy series. And uh, he said, do you know these guys at Gotham Comedy Club? And the guys were like, yeah, we used to have an office right above them. Are you kidding and me? And we tried to, yeah, they, on 22nd right. Street. And they said, <laughs> you know, great. we worked on other stuff with them. Yeah, cool so them. they came in, we sat down and talked, and I said, look, you know, my brother and I were like, the show should be this. And uh, we pitched the Cuban on a Thursday, and he ordered the pilot on Friday. I That's love a, that. You know, it was like, boom, that was it. I love that. I love that. See that? The, yeah, that's the, that's the way. But, but that's right. what success is. That's success. That's pull the, the pull the fucking. And I will tell you, like I I've had you know other shows being development for six months, a year. Shows. You know, yeah. you know, So it's you know the way it had. And then you know we did the pilot episode, and actually Brian Callen hosted it, which he's starting to blow up now. I love Brian Callen. He man. cracks me up. Brian he's, is a genius. Yeah, he's so funny. One so of my talented. favorite podcasts was ten minute podcast with him and uh, and. Um, uh, what's the other guy name? The guy's name? Well, now I think that the fighter and the kid is killing it. <laughs> no, I know fighter and the kid yeah. are killing it. Yeah. yeah. No, that was a a joke to Will and the other guy. What's the other guy's name? Yeah. The other guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So he. So Brian Callen was the host of the first, the first comedy live. Yeah. yeah, did, yeah. Why did you choose him? He he was a recognizable face, a great act, a friend. You know. And a friend. What what I thought was interesting is to do a live show. Well, that was the whole club. At a comedy club. Yeah, How the you know, fuck it's do you like pull that off. It was stressful, you know. I mean, and the people, logistics. Uh, people didn't get like it was. Well, listen, even the pilot episode and, and telling the acts and Brian's my dear. We told Brian it's live, live, and and he didn't realize it was live, live. So he bl he blew somebody's intro and said, "All right, let's uh, let's do that again." And we were like, "Dude, <laughs> this is happening. You're on TV right now. <laughs> There's no take two. <laughs> right. You're not in Hollywood, man. I would get so busted doing that. You're in the middle of Manhattan doing a live show, Brian." I love Brian Callen. But uh, that in and of itself might have been worked because it's funny. It's a moment. You know? yeah. It's live.
you know, in this show, it just, it was, it was great because one of the nicest things about it, well, first of all, the fact that it was live was really cool. There was no editing, that was it. And, you know, there was no language barriers, no subject, you could That's talk whatever, you know, so, and I think one of the reasons it worked is you were putting comics in an environment they were comfortable in. You know, they were in a comedy club, you know, so this it wasn't like, world. they're in a theater, they're in a studio, right. there was a real comedy club with a real audience, right. you know. Yep. Yeah, the cameras are there, but once you kind of get into your set, you kind of lose all that. So they were kind of able to do their thing. I mean, the difficulty was timing it all out because it was live. So we had to cut for commercials and get the next cut, you know, and it's like. What's the one thing you, that, that really helped it be successful? Was it, a, was it the fact that you had a guy in the back waving his hands and flashing lights at them? Or was it, like, what's the oil uh, uh, logistically, you know? Between my brother, you know, the guys we produced the show with, uh, Rob, uh, C and Dave Goldberg, uh, you know, all the people that worked in that show were people that we knew. You know, like the director who directed almost every em uh, episode was a great friend, still is a good friend, Bob Lampell. He did another series uh, that we did from the old club. So the crew, like they were all friend, they were all, all our people, you know? So, so it was like, it was such time. a cohesive unit. Yeah. And I got to tell you, we all loved each other, all loved working with one another. Um, and That's key. the goal was we want to put out the best possible product that we could put out, yes. you know? So it's like, you know, my brother, uh, Leanne Weingarten, uh, uh, myself booked the talent for the show. And like, we really worked hard on, on making great shows, balanced shows, and putting new people, like every single episode, there was at least one person, sometimes two, making their TV debut. Yeah, that's, that's So cool. it's like, that's it's, you cool. know, to yeah, see I kids come up, and it's like, yeah. and, and, and like, look, a lot of the guys, those tapes change careers, change sure lives, you know, you a legitimate tape on a TV sure, show, I mean, come where on. you're killing in front of an audience, yeah. it, it helps, you know, it's like, you it's know. A, it's a different world for them now. Michael Che did it before he got SNL. Pete Davidson did it before he got SNL. You know, there were a number of people who, you know, and their careers are, you know. And that's part that. of their repertoire is to have this live a TV show appearance. And by the way, you know, and I guess when somebody looks at that, it's not just about how funny they are. It's about how they handle themselves in a live situation. That's a big yeah. deal for a comedian. Oh, yeah, and it's great. You and know? what's cool about those two guys <laughs> is, you know, they did like earlier seasons, like maybe season one, two, or three, we brought them back later in the cycle of the show to host the show. So yeah. here's a guy who started out getting his first TV, and then they came back more hosting the show. Right. You know? And then you must marvel at how much they've grown or not. <laughs> yeah, no, they, yeah, they, <laughs> they grow, they grow. Yeah, they grow. See, that's yeah. amazing that you're into comedy like this, because you, you and I have known each other for a while on and yeah. off through our, uh, several com yeah. mutual comedian friends. Yep. And um, I have to say hi to my man Billy Hayes, La Machine, one oh. of my best friends in the world. That guy's one of the best people I know. He what? is the salt of the earth. He's just such a good, solid human being. He is. That is exactly what I was not going to say, but I'll keep it at that. <laughs> he's a horrible person. No, he really is. Nah, he really is the sweetest. He's dependable as they come. He's a, and, he, and he really facilitated this. You know? Yeah. No, I know. We've been to dinner together, you and I and Billy and stuff, and we've known each other for a long time, mm -hmm. but it was him. You know, I was walking. We, we left dinner the, the last time, yep. and... He just smacked me in the back of the head. You know, he's my good yeah. friend from Brooklyn. Yeah. So he's allowed to do that. He just smacks me in the head. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I know what that means. That means I have an idea. Right. It's, not a, it's not he's mad at me. So I go, yeah. what? What's up? And he goes, fucking Chris. You and Chris have to do a show together. I was, I was with you guys. It was the most interesting dinner I've had in t 20 years. You guys should sit down and talk. So he facilitated this. And um, I want to say I appreciate it. And thank you, Billy. But I'll never yeah. let you on the show. <laughs> Because <laughs> you're a horrible fucking person other than that. Um, but, but, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when last time we were together is, you know, I'm really interested. I'm very curious about people. So uh, this might seem like I'm going way back, but, you know, I, I want to know you a little bit better. Like, wh where were you born, Chris? Where, New York? Was it Brooklyn? Queens. You were in Queens. You and, and your Flushing. brother? Flushing, Queens. That makes two of us. What hospital? Yeah. Booth Memorial. No way. Yeah. Right there on uh, Main Street. Yeah. Which has like had 30 names since then, but I'm a Booth Memorial guy. Yeah. I, 73. Think, it's, I think it's back to Booth Memorial now. Oh, it might really. Yeah. Well, we switched up. No, I got yeah. some years on you. No, I'm older than you. Uh, 65. I ain't got eight years on me. All right. All right. But yeah, I was a Booth you Memorial person. I hate when people yeah. say you look great. He does I'm, look good. I want, I, they've never said it to <laughs> me. Me you know. neither. <laughs> just one time. Can you, next time I see you, TJ, just lie to me. So, mm. you know, nowadays, guys, they call it frushing. It's not yeah. flushing I, anymore. Oh, sadly. It's, really it's, very it's very great changed. place for a massage. Yeah, but my brother told me, though, because I'm the oldest, Steve's the youngest. We have two in between. So he was actually born in Long Island. 
So you're the oldest. Yeah. And Steve is the youngest. Is the youngest. He's your partner. Yeah. And the two in between. Yeah. The, two Mazzillis. Yeah. My sister's in the fashion world. And my other brother and my cousin have an uh, aerospace uh, repair state, uh, company. No, no short of intelligence of <laughs> Mazzilli. <laughs> A family. My, now, you know my, what it is? It's not, it has nothing, it has nothing to do with intelligence. You know what it is? It's drives. It's drives. Uh, you know, it's funny to talk about Main Street. So my dad had a fruit and vegetable store on Main Street, and we grew up, you know, my dad had his own businesses, and he had a work ethic like no other, and my mom worked. So we just, we grew up with a work ethic, I, you know? You work, I, Let you me know? just say this, man. I fucking love you. You want to know why? Nice. Because he's a Mazzilli. So as an Italian, you know, I always... You know, I, I always tell people how, you know, I've never knew what it was really like to be offended until I saw The Sopranos. The only problem with The Sopranos is that, you know, you, you, it's like, hey, Tony, you want I should whack him? And then, mm -hmm. you know, th I was offended for 20 seconds until I said, that's pretty spot on, some of the guys I know. You know like those, but yeah. you represent the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mike Ricca calls it the Gotti Giuliani spectrum. Like, and you can fall anywhere on the Italian spectrum. But you guys represent a lot of the people that I know and grew up with that are Italian and that they had these hardworking parents and they instilled that drive to succeed in, in you. Yeah, right? I, I, I don't know anything else. You know, I mean, it's kind of, that's all I know. That's all you know. You know. But I'm sure, you know, growing up in Flushing, 70s, 80s, there was, you had your share of, of wise guys. Well, I was out, oh yeah, no, no question about right. it. You know, but I was out when I was three. You All right, know. so Long so, Island. Yeah, but it's not, not a, not a yeah. <laughs> So wait, wait, where on the island? Yeah. Northport. Okay. So Port Washington. So oh, yeah, yeah. We're following each other's footsteps. That's yeah. fantastic. Next, yeah. I'm going to buy a club in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I'll run it no. into the ground. <laughs> well um, into the ground. <laughs> so, you, so you moved to Long Island. That was a, that's a big deal. That's yeah. a, that helps, yeah. being in Long Island and getting out of, out of Queens. No, and it was, a, and it was a, you know, my parents moved to a great little town called Northport. Um, a very nice town. You know, town it's like... We moved to East Northport a few years after that, but the, the Northport proper, it's like, it's one of those like little special towns that like the trolley tracks still run down Main Street, you know, the bank, the sweet, the whole thing, it, it literally, it's like you go into that town, it's like stepping back to like 1929. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it is really nice. To me, going to Long Island, we always called it going to the country when we were in Brooklyn, you know, yeah. we're going to the country. So it's and we said going to the city. Going I mean, to the and, city and, right. was, and let me tell you something. It was a big deal to go to the city. Sure, it was. Oh, it was you know, your friends like, you're going to the city. Yeah, you right. know? it's like you're taking hey, your yeah, life hey, in your hands. <laughs> you're driving. You're taking yeah. the train. Yeah, you're really? taking your life in your hands. It was a big deal back then. Well, you know what? It was though. I mean, you like, I yep. moved here in '83. Let me tell you something. Oh fuck. The city was. It was a completely different place. First wild. of all, people don't realize. There were freaking burned out cars on the West Side Highway. Not like one. No, that's Multiple. That's that. Like. Think about it now. He's, he's nodding his head, yeah. The, 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 if there was a burned out car, it, it would be gone in, in, a, in two seconds. Not only now, would it be gone, multiple, there'd be there was an trash. uproar. Exactly, there'd be an uproar. I was talking about this the other day. I said what yep. killed Brooklyn was bike lanes. Like now, it. Bike, now bicyclists have rights, which is fine. But in my Brooklyn, you're just happy to make it through whatever fucking neighborhood you're in. Well, I mean, that was another thing. Like, there were neighborhoods that you, could not, you did not go you to. You didn't go to. You know, even like Times Square was still rough at that time. Like the city... You know, like, and, and you mentioned Giuliani, to his credit, he really got the city to a different level, you he know, and, for, and from, you know, a business perspective, he was great for, you know, greatest he, thing he, he cleaned greatest it up. Thing. Greatest, greatest mayoral move I've ever seen. He set the Amongst tone. them, I guess. I don't know many other mm -hmm. mayoral moves other yeah. than that one. I don't know what a mayoral move is, mm -hmm. Chad. I'm making shit up as I go along. Go for it. It sounded good. It got you that's fine into it. I, I, I was, that I was like sounded like a Fake it till you make it. Yeah. All right. You see what I'm saying? All right. So, no, but truthfully, for business, I mean, look at what he's done, man. That, that's a, a direct, re all of this is a direct, re this wouldn't yeah. exist without that. Still. No, it, you know, so, it's true. And it's like, you know, to speak about this business, because we kind of went off on a tangent. It's like, yeah. I feel very blessed, very lucky to be in this business. It's, it's, it's literally a great business. You know, it's like, I love all about it. It's just, it's, it's, it's special. That's not a typical disposition of a comedy club owner, is it? No, I mean, listen, I, you, you talk to most people in life, and they don't like what they do. And I'll tell you, my father did not like what he did. You know, it's, yeah. he... He didn't like it. Well, he, 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 what did he what do happened, when he went to Long Island? What was he doing? So, you know, he, he's still in the fruit, fruit still business. Still in the fruit I mean, business. Yeah, I mean, eventually he became supermarkets, and now he does wholesale. But, you know, his father became ill and died very young uh, in his early 50s. And, and, and um, I'm sorry, his father came from Italy or your father came from Italy? His father. His father came from... Where in Italy? Um... Naples. Naples. Yeah. The Mazzilli's from Naples. Any relationship to the uh, Lee Mazzilli? How yes. many people have asked you that? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. He, so he, I don't know him well. I met him one time. Actually, I met him here. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's we figured out that our uh, our great grandfathers were from Corato. Um, oh, that's but he's a very nice guy, and actually, I met him through you know the actor Dan Laurie who played the father on The Wonder Years. Yes. Yeah. So Dan is a friend. I've known him <coughs> twenty or so years now. Yeah. And he knows Lee very well, and he kept trying to put it together, and then finally, <laughs> um, you know. You know, you you have to be in your forties and fifties when you talk to Chris Mazzilli and ask if he knew Lee Mazzilli. You know, like he was a he Lee he was born oh, he was raised a rock in Brooklyn. Star. He was he yeah. came from Brooklyn. I think yeah. he went to Lincoln or Lafayette he, High he School. He went to Lincoln. He went to Lincoln High School. Yeah. He All was my, a speed a speed skater. You know, How'd he, you know? Do you know about Lincoln High School? Oh like, yeah, yeah, no, I really. But because. My godfather, Vito, I know you're shocked to hear my godfather's name was Vito. <laughs> May he rest in peace. He was a great man. God bless so, him. godfather, v- oh, just no. as the non Italian in the room, I really have to put a highlighter on that. Okay. He did say godfather, Vito. And he yeah. also said, God bless him and rest in peace. And I said, yeah. God rest his soul. Yeah. Right. All right. All right. All right. I'm just making sure. That's the. No, that's, I'm, that's, I just. I need to highlight that anything, for people. That anything less than that response from me would have warranted a problem as yeah, soon exactly. as I left this I building. Understand. There would have been a couple of guys looking to speak to me. Yeah. <laughs> right? But so, he, he was a good man. But he used to talk to Lee's father all the time. And, they, and you know, they both died. So it kind of cut off that contact with that part of the family. But, you know, Mazzilli is not really a common name. And I have right. found that most people I've met with that name, I'm related to. Yeah, that's what happens. I mean, yeah. eventually, if you, if it, if, you know, once you get back to Italy. Have you ever been to Italy? No, no. Your Everybody d- else in my family has. Your DNA me. starts tingling like nothing. Yeah, no, like I know. And you know, it's it's interesting because I've done some research on, on the name, and there was an Italian motorcycle company called Mazzilli. They only made a few bikes like in the 70s. I'm dying to get one. I'm a big Mazzilli fan. You know, Chris oh, Mazzilli fan. Thanks, well, Tremendously. Mutual. And I like to know what drives people. Like, So that childhood had, that you had, from a young age, was your father a funny guy? Was he, a, was he always driven or was it... Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you right about my, my dad's the best guy I know. Period. Yeah. I mean, he's just a, he's a good a, person, a great, great man. You know, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And my mom, they, they're just they're good people. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, do we have fun in the house? Absolutely. Is my dad funny? No, he's more into music. I mean, he played trumpet. I mean, you know, what I remember a lot about childhood was my dad worked hard. You know, he worked six days a week. He had his own businesses. You know, uh, he would commute to Queens. So like. You know, like when I woke up in the morning, he was already at work. And when I went to bed, he wasn't home yet. You right, know, so right. Sunday was a day to see, you know, my dad. And <laughs> Sunday was like music day. And, you know, he'd play, you know, his records, blast them. We would all dance and he'd play trumpet every now and then. What, and kind of, what kind of music would he play in the house? Four lads, four seasons? Oh, he, four lads, he loves four, <laughs> four you know. Four seasons, yeah, the crew cuts. You know, he, um, <laughs> Sinatra. Sinatra, you know. that's my father, man. The four seasons. Well, did he did he have like a doo-wop group when he was grow- growing up? Or was he one of no, those? No, but I'll tell you, like musical? him and his brothers, when we had like family gatherings, they all played instruments and they would get together and play. Like matter of fact, I'm just thinking now. I got to call. My, my, it's my uncle Joey's birthday today. You got to make my sure dad, we call him. Yeah, my my dad's youngest brother. He's another great guy. You know, he talked about an interesting character. Google that guy. Yeah. Oh, jo- Joey Mazzilli. Joey Mazzilli. He actually uh, ex cop infiltrated the mob. Uh, he just such an interesting, interesting character. Oh he had a God. series on A um, and E called Runaway Squad, where he went after Runaways. Runaway Squad. Yeah. Joe Mazzilli. Yeah. Uh, and he went. He went and he went and chased down Runaways. Yeah. What, did it have success stories on the show? When he, oh yeah, when he found oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'd love to see how he, what kind of intel you got to pick up, and what kind of detective you have to be to go and find a runaway. He was a good detective. He's a sharp guy. Now oh, that's good stuff, man. Let's delete my name from this, though, chat. Yes. Um, no, just for making Which one, the stone note. or all the other it, one? All, all of it. it. And hide my voice. Make me sound like an Asian. You got it, Bruno <laughs> Durling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so he wasn't necessarily... So it wasn't like... So I guess then when your brothers came along, was that... I'm trying to make the comedy connection. Like, how do you... You, you're, you go to high school in, in, I, I, so, in Long Island? So, so I'm going to tell you how the comedy thing all came about. Okay. So my mother's father was Dominic was hilarious he was a funny guy Dominic yeah he was just um he made us laugh all the time and there's also you know unfortunately there's a lot of uh sadness in the family because my mother's sister well uh, we moved to Long Island because my mother's sister Marie lived out there with her three kids the youngest is now my brother Matt's partner he's like my older brother my cousin Dominic great guy my mom moved out there because her sister moved out out the uh, hop hog so she, we moved out there in 68 to be closer to her. Well, my Aunt Marie, got, who's my godmother, got diagnosed with cancer, oh. leukemia, and was dead a year later. You know? Fuck. And it Fucking cancer, man. Devastated my mom. 
yeah. devastated my mom, yeah. you know. And, you well, know, as a kid, you don't want to see your mom sad. And the so kids, too. You know, you get three kids she had. At, at that time, she had uh, three of us, and then Stephen was born in 70. Yeah. And as a kid, you don't want to see your mom sad. So, like, I'd make my mom laugh. That's how, that's how it started, that's you know. And I would mimic my grandfather, you know. And then, you know, uh, my dad, unfortunately, lost his only sister to cancer in 80. She also left three sons. And in between there, you know, that uh, aunt, my Aunt Rosemary, lost a daughter. She was my age. Jesus she was, I was, Christ. I was eight and she was seven. She had a allergic reaction to penicillin and died. You know, so it was, it was like one of those fucked up things where my mother's Aunt Nettie died and my cousin um, Kathy Jean died like within a day of one another. They both laid out at the same funeral parlor. Aunt Nettie. We have an Aunt Nettie in the family. Yeah. Aunt Annette. That's like a defense mechanism and almost. That's exactly right. So I never want to see my mom sad and, you know, I was going to make my mom laugh. So that's how it kind of was kind of the window. But the thing that really kind of hit it off comedy wise for me, like that threw it into, you know, hyper speed was my dad had a store in Forest Hill, Forest Hills, Queens. I love that. One of my dad's customers <laughs> <He's so happy. laughs> gave him front row seats to see Don Rickles at West Bend Music Fair. That's what I was going to ask you. Don and, and, not, and who, who better than Don Rickles, right? So my dad called my mom all excited with the tickets and said, Ro, my mom's name is Roseanne, I got tickets to see Don Rickles' front row seat. My mother said, I'm not sitting in the front row for him because he's an insult comic. So my dad took me. She wouldn't go. No, she wouldn't go. She's Are you kidding wife. me? No. Yeah, but that's the opportunity of a lifetime. That's I mean, an if Italian anybody's going to do it. That's an Italian woman from New York. She doesn't want to be in the spotlight. This yeah. is not my world. Nope. She, she don't, and she doesn't want to be insulted. So you know? my mom, you know, bailed, and I went. So, um, you know, it was, it was great. Um, you know, and the band played, and, you know, Rickles comes out, hits the stage, starts going through his act, and then sees me and my father. And he comes right over to us, and he says to my father, he goes, you stupid hockey puck. What the hell did you take a kid here for? What did you do? Tell him it's Disney World? He's going to piss his pants. You're going to have to take him home. And he kind of winked at me, shook my hand, shook my dad's hand, and then went on. And he was awesome. So and from you that fell in love with him. From that point on, I was able to stay up late and watch Carson whenever he was on or comedians were on. So wow. from that age on, I got that's hooked. In, great. That's how I got hooked into comedy. You know, so I just, you know, my grandfather was like the first comedian. And he just. But that's a connection. See, here's the thing, man. It's inherent in you to be so. And then eventually, did you, the first thing you ever would, how old were you when you realized that you were funny? You know, usually it's high school, right? Sometime around that that period. I mean, because I, I, you know, I was, and I know it's hard to believe, and still I'm very uninhibited. So I I mean, even in high school, like, for like variety shows and talent shows, we do. Like me and my best friend Louis Benor got up on stage and did Cheech and Chong. You know, I mean, another time I got up and we did uh, Cheech and Chong. There was a song uh, by Crystal Gale and Eddie Eddie Rabbit called "Just You and I," and it started out serious. Like we had a, a concert pianist playing the beginning of the song, and then Louis came out and was singing the male part, and then I came out in a pink dress and sang the female part. People were going bananas. What's Louis' so, last name? Benora. Benora. Yeah. Do you see him still to this day? Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, he lives on the island. I don't see him as much as I'd like to, but he's a great guy. But, you know, I grew up. I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate, <coughs> knock on wood. I have a core group of friends, some since I know, since I'm 10 and younger, about 15 of us that are still in touch. That's unheard of. And we get together. That's pretty cool. Well, I'll take another level. I, I got those guys, like my buddy Tom LeVacri, Chris Haynes, Alan Wilson, Mike Greenblatt. There's a whole group of us to get together like every three or four months for dinner, you know. Um, and at one point, my dad had a store in our hometown, so all my friends worked in the store. Louis, Don DeFalco, John DeFalco, all, you know, this guy Chris Hank, you and know. what about Bernie Friedman? He didn't work in there? <laughs> <laughs> I heard he was great with fruit. No, 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 no. No, no, no. He's, oh, I'm sorry. Bernie's father owned the building. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's right. I hate this. It sounds stereotypical, but it's Long but, Island. But it is Long Island. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was, it's, it's our roots. It's all of our roots. <laughs> you know, it, it was the best because, like, literally, we would, you know, as – in college or you know high school, we would go out till three, four o'clock in the morning. Literally, go pull our cars up by the store, sleep in the car for a couple yeah, hours, and go to work. Get up, wait a minute, get up, <laughs> go to work, and you know what we'd have for breakfast. I'm not even joking. We would go to the deli that was in the shopping center of the store, order six scrambled eggs, bacon, ham, and cheese, yeah. and get a quarter tropicana orange juice. Yep. That was breakfast. That sounds like 
Sounds about right. And sounds we, like my weekend. And it we were, sounds we were about burning. Right. You know, sounds about you know right. You're, as a kid, you're burning. But right college. now, that's a, that is a stay in the hospital. Yeah, it's yeah. A hard yeah. Exactly. To pull that off. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and it wasn't like we had it once. We'd have it all no, the time. This is the way you live. I mean, that that store itself. Like there was another buddy of mine. Me, uh, he passed unfortunately. Uh, this guy knew longer than anybody. I knew him since I was three. He worked in this store, uh, Kenny Barola. Now the rich cavalier. I mean, they were like probably 15 of us that worked at the same time in the store and it was insane like we would have food fights like you would not believe like you see that's that's in the, the back room and i felt bad like every now and then my dad would walk in and i'd be like oh fuck you know <laughs> and he he he'd just walk in like look at me like really and he just walk out. he was so yeah. disgusted yeah, he walked he, out. But, you know, he knows the but next we thing kids. you're gonna we, do we were 17 years old yeah, of you course, know of course. we would lock two guys in the refrigerator and they'd beat the shit out of each other for a half hour and, and then come back out <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'm thinking about it now. Oh my God! There was one story. So our church was two blocks behind the store. Yeah, anything that starts off with church is a problem. Right. So on Sundays, I would watch the store. You know, so I was running this whole store by myself. No, you, you know, sound and like I, you were very qualified. To, and I, you know, to and watch no, the but store. I, I actually I was I responsible. When you I had took, to be, right? I, I yeah, took right. it all seriously. Right, right. I was at lunch. You know, and uh, I don't even know how I came up with it, but a lot of the old timers that used to work in the store would have like work shoes and you know that they'd work in and then dress shoes but mm-hmm. the, the funny thing was their work shoes were dress shoes that were just old so you had guys working <laughs> all day in like two inch platform <laughs> vinyl shoes that was their work shoe you know like yeah, you all couldn't the find anything yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> you know I don't know what I do one day but it's like so fucking funny I just picture wait, the black socks on work shoes you have shoes. no idea where this is going <laughs> so when an eggplant starts to go bad, it gets like brown spots on it, and you really can't sell because people want a perfect, you know, eggplant. We're so, spoiled when it comes to the appearance of our fruits and vegetables. Yeah, when very an egg, spoiled. Egg, eggplant in my neighborhood goes bad. It usually has to do with crack cocaine. Yeah. Right. But I'm sorry, we <laughs> yes, might edit. Yeah, I might I mean, edit that out. I just couldn't. I had to say it because I'm sorry. It's part of my DNA. So what happened was I don't know where I came with this idea, but one day my buddies were hanging out, and I. There was a, an ex-worker who left his shoes there. I took the guy's shoes. I may even still be working. His name was Joe Trelunga. I took his shoes. I put them on. And I took an eggplant. <laughs> and I went out and I punted it out of the back door <laughs> through the parking lot. Like 40 yards, Why? you know? <laughs> so it just became like a thing we would do. And my buddy Dom would be like a long snapper. He'd take like five eggplants. He'd go out, on the, out <laughs> in the parking lot and he would hike them to me. And I would take them because I played soccer. And I would take these eggplants literally 40, 50 yards in the parking lot, you mm-hmm. know? <laughs> so I'll never forget it. One day... Hold on, you would get 40, 50 yards, huh? Oh, yeah. I, oh, I, I could wild you. them. Yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't just it explode just, on, on contact? Sometimes it would. Depend. That's depend. what I would love to it see. It depends on how you hit it. eggplant. You know? Chris Mazzilli and the exploding eggplant. So, so one day, he hikes it to me. I'm about to punt it. I turn around and look, and my father is stopped in his car on his way to church, looking at me, and I was like, oh, my God. What'd I do? And he literally just, he looked at me. Put his head down, shook it, and just slowly <laughs> drove away. And I was like, fuck. God. He saw you punting eggplants. And you know what? He never said a word about it. Why? I came on that night for dinner. Why? I, well, you know why? Because uh, he's an old Italian dad. He knows just the look might be enough. It was. It was just enough. It, it, you know man. what? And, it's it like, and he knew like, I never wanted to disappoint him. And, and for the most part, it was a good kid. I never got in trouble. That's so the I thing. You he were probably a good said, kid. you know what? Uh, whatever, let him blow Yeah, up you know, speed. I'm a father now. I might have a, my son's going to be 13, and my other guy's eight years old. He's going to be nine. And um, it's funny, you know, I was a wild, wild kid, and my wife knows me for a very long time. And some of the things, you know, what you're explaining times 10 with Italian maniacs in Brooklyn is my life. Like, you're talking about some really crazy shit that happened. And so when my kids act up a little bit, you know, they start fighting, they start making fun of people, whatever they do. My wife gets yeah. on them so quick. Like, I'm like, come, yeah, you know they're, they're what? fucking it's, boys, man. Uh, it's always, yeah, it's it's, always it, the fellas, you know? It's yeah. the fellas. We're, we're retarded. Men are retarded, essentially, we're, we're, deep down. We're different. We're just a different breed, you know? And it's like, you got to kind of let boys be. I'm not saying hurt anybody. No. You know, and I got to tell you, like, my I mean, friends, unless the they guys, deserve it. The guys I talked about, all good guys. Yeah. You know, all good kids. Of Not course. that we didn't have our fun, you know, I mean. Of course. But he's yeah, like, right. I, you know, I don't know if you know, I don't drink. I never did. You That's, know? I'm, we're going to have to wrap it up, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this has been fun. Thank you, so, Chris, for having us down how here. How did you not, why, why did you, did you ever try it? Uh, I didn't like the way it tasted. Oh, but really? I, so I was, you but, have always been, had a natural aversion to just the Yeah, way it I tastes. mean, it started out that I was really into sports and I wanted to be the best I could be, so I 
That still doesn't drink. make sense, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, As a fellow job. There's like steam yeah. coming off your head there. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, trying to compute well, all this. this. Is, this is, He's I'm, got a look of bewilderment. I, you know? <laughs> see, oh, I know. See, here's what we're doing. He's Giuliani spectrum. I'm te- teetering in yeah. the middle somewhere. This yeah. is my DNA. is like, Teetering in the middle? <laughs> well, okay. Trying no, to be nice you're also setting his Giuliani <laughs> spectrum is what you're doing. All, all my buddies... You know, We're drank animals. and you know, but yeah. I, I drank a lot. You know, yeah, yeah. Even like you know, I think about like college. Like I mentioned about my high school friends, my college friends, my college roommates who I've known since '83. We get together every Monday night for dinner and have, and we take a trip once a year. That's incredible. Yeah, you know, I just had dinner with them last night. That's great, man. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting. Well, if I may, I think the successful people are the ones that keep friends for a long time. Like, and I think in order to really look, even with you, I mean, you, you and your, the guys, I have recently met TJ this year, became friends. He's introduced me to some friends he's had for decades. Yeah. yeah and I think yeah. the people that are really successful in life are the ones that keep friends for a long time because you need somebody to bounce shit off of yeah. and like to oh, be there for you. The longer yeah, they're there, you know, the better that's you are. True. That's it's true. Like, it's like yep. therapy. I mean, these guys, John, my, my college buddies, John, John and Eric, I mean, they're just they're, they're other great guys, you know, I'm salt of the earth. That's you know? good stuff, man. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, this day and age, man, some of the things we used to do as kids, you cannot do. You know, you just listen. You, you can't even go out. Like when I was a kid, you know, and I'm talking about like 10, 11, in the summertime, I leave the house early in the morning, go play baseball all day, mm-hmm. come home to have lunch or have lunch there. And th- th- but we were gone. We'd ride, we were gone all, all day. day. You started as a stand up comedian. The first thing you did in comedy was to go do stand up, right, Chris? Yeah, yeah. So, Where? Um, How old? When? What? So the fuck. I'll tell you exactly. <laughs> One question at a time. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I was going to Columbia. I wanted to be an attorney. And I blew my knees out. Playing soccer. Did you really? Yeah. Uh, How old were you when you blew your knees out? Was it just a gradual 16. thing? Sixteen. What do you mean you? Sixteen. You had, a, you had a, a, a cartilage and ligament damage, so it ended my soccer career. Was it gradual? Or was it just like one game, or was it was it just was it just it wear happened and tear? during a practice? And you blew both of them out. Yeah. When you say you blew them out, what happened? I was doing wind sprints with a guy on my back. Oh fuck! And one happened, and I didn't think it was that now, maybe bad. Maybe you are closer happened. to my end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> no, so, but you had wind sprints when and just that extra weight. Yeah, with a guy on my back, a guy with weight a lot more than I did. So I um I wound up going to FIT. I studied menswear design. I did that for a half a second and decided, you know what, I'm twenty years old in Manhattan. I want to go to acting school. I went to acting school. Yeah. Not a hard guy to look at, right? Pretty good looking uh, guy in high in, in college, FIT. All the girls are at FIT. That was interesting. That was an interesting place. Yeah, that's what, for sure. What, what, uh, where's this place? FIT, FIT Fashion Institute. No, no, but just location. If I mean, just it's oh, over 27 there. Oh, just like, oh, I'm just right. It's over there. Just over, I'll be there. I'll <laughs> yeah. be back. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that, yeah. I used to have to be physically restrained from that place. You know? <laughs> we have a slightly different upbringing. When I was, I would work construction with my uncles, and any time they had a job close to the FIT, they wouldn't let me go there. I it's would, th- I would go to lunch and try to talk to all the girls. You know, they're so beautiful over there. So I, I went to FIT, the acting school. You know, started working as an actor here and there. Did a couple of law, law and orders, and I wasn't. You did working. a couple of law and orders. Yeah. Did you really early yeah. on? Early on. In the early that seems 90s. to be like the go-to thing. Yeah, if you're you a know, New York actor, actor, it's pretty right? much you know were you, you get on one of those. What, were you a defendant? Were you you know cop number three? I was a detective and I was uh, a paramedic. A paramedic and a detective. Yeah. Any lines? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, both of them. One of them I remember was like uh, I was telling uh, the guys how a guy died. So it's not like a guy was pretty handy with his feet. I don't know what the fuck it was. <laughs> pretty handy with his feet. Meaning like, you know, a guy got kicked and got, got his head kicked in. Um, it's such a factory of, of yeah. episodes of Law & Order, right? Yeah. And, it's such, oh, and, and it just machine. churns out. And yeah. it keeps people in New York working. Yeah, you know how many people, great. You know how many people I know that work on the set? Graphic designers, prop masters, Listen, actors. Listen, I still get checks for like 11 cents from residuals. That's just, that's, yeah, the, you know. the stamp costs 50 cents and the check is 11. <laughs> So he's <laughs> so um so you so yeah right, so he gets a couple of roles and yeah I did and I did the Sopranos thing. you know so oh actually, you did the Sopranos yeah but it, most of it got cut out cut that, out. that's a, that's a story for another time it had nothing to do with me it was the other guy I was working with but oh really why because there was some hard feelings there no no no, no not, not at all no there was just an issue with lines and somebody not wanting to say the line the way that it was to be said but Re- well hold on I know it's a long story but why was it an Italian guy what's that was it an Italian actor. Yeah, it just there was because an issue with the lines, and they wound up cutting some of the stuff out. The guy didn't line. want to say the line the way What's they it? wanted him to say the line. I believe that was a problem. What was the line? Do you remember? No. Please that, tell me. No, please. if I knew, I would tell you. <laughs> if, honestly, if I knew. I, I mean, come on, man. What is the line? 
hey, maybe I should uh, smack him in the forehead. And the guy goes, Mom, I'm sorry, my guy would never smack him in the forehead. It would always be the chin. Like, what are you, what, what are you arguing the, the, about the, on the fucking The story Sopranos. prior to that was actually how, how it, when I went up there. was a buddy of mine was working in the writer's room at that show. And he said, you know, you should, and I was pretty much on my way out of the, I was opening the club. So I was kind of, I knew I was getting out of that business and I wanted to focus on the club. Yeah. He goes, hey, you know, you should go in and meet uh, Meredith Tucker, I think the girl's name was. She was the casting director and it was Georgiana Walken. He said, you go in to meet and, and read for them. So I met him, it went well. And they're like, you know, I'll have you come back and read for this role. And the role was to play Carmela's nephew, you know. Oh, really? Which crazy sidebar. Edie Falco went to my high school. She was two years older than me. Oh, wow. You know. Um, Edie Falco went to your high school. That's amazing. Yeah. Everybody's connected in this crazy You know, not crazy to drop way. any names, but I had her in that studio on that podcast, You Can't Stand. Yeah. Just saying, just saying. Yeah. He has a, a podcast that's very pretentious. It's not. It's a really great show. And very like, oh, yeah. Everyone if you, if you're not out. world really famous, actors, you can't be on this lots show. Lots of real actors. I'm fucking with People who are working in the industry. It's a very successful podcast. Well, that's, What's know. the name of it? Uh, Little Known Facts with I Alana mean, Levine. Define Who's working. Uh, Edie Falco, <laughs> Julianne Moore. Yeah, but besides um, them. Oh, besides Alan them. Alda. So I'll tell you who else uh, went, Alda, to, went to Northwood <laughs> High School. Another well-known actress, Patty LuPone. Another North Park. Oh, Patty oh, she LuPone. Had her on the show. Had, of course she did. Did Pat, you really? Yeah, Patty LuPone's oh, wonderful. Of course. Although I'm not crazy about this He's a cocky paper. little fuck, this guy. Oh, I'm, nah, a, I'm the cocky cockiest son of a Julie, super Julie like me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, he's, he's doing it to fuck with me <laughs> because his, the show Because sucks. you like fucking... It's horrible. You can't even listen to it. It's, it's fan, unlistenable. It's a really good show. It's horrendous. It's a really good show. So you but went in and you did the lines. So you went in and you did the lines. So they had me read for Carmela's nephew and they I got a call back or two and then I went and met David Chase and I read for him. Okay, and, and cool. He, he was very nice. And he said, look, he was a great job in, with the rating. He said, but I don't feel you'd be intimidated by Tony Soprano. I said, okay. And then like a week later, they called me up and said, David liked you and he's going to give you this, this little role. Oh, wow. So, he f- that's, so there was something inherent in yeah. who you are. Yeah, when, when I look at the casting of that show, and this is not... Oh, it was this, fantastic. It, the casting was phenomenal, right? However, I, you know, I don't know if this is going to come off as an insult. Maybe it is. It just seems to me like they got the people who acted and looked. There's not a lot of acting going on is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, I'll, but, I'll but, tell but you I don't though, mean that to, in a negative way. Even be, acting. I mean, he, it's hard, here's the it's thing, a, though. See, it's an insult. There's no way to say it without being To be being yourself with the cameras rolling, right. it, it, right. it, it, it ain't easy. It's you know? fight or flight. I, yeah. I talk about it all the time. Those eyes are on you, right? The, right? I mean, and you, who knows this better than you as a, a club owner? Like, the eyes on you, it's the same biological trigger as a mammal with a thousand eyes on them being hunted. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's how, it, it's, that's it, how deep it's it runs. It's, it's a very nerve-wracking right? uh, thing. You right. Know? So what happens is that, you know, I, I, to- I toyed around with the acting for a while, and then out of my frustration that I wasn't working as an actor enough, I started doing stand-up, you know? And it was fun, you well, know? It's like, I, I did like an open mic at some bar and then, you know, started doing like amateur shows. you remember your first show? Yeah, it was an open mic at the Eagle Tavern, which used to be on uh, 14th Street, just um, east of 9th Avenue. Why did you do it? Did you were you, pr- you 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 wanted to do it? Any yeah. pro- anybody no. prompt you? When no. any of the boys no, say, no, "Hey, you should go no, do it"? No, no, no. So, so you're a little bit of a freak then. Did you? Were you terrified yeah. when you got up? Oddly enough, no. Yeah. So you got it. Yeah, I just, I you, just, you know, you got that thing. it was very conversational, and I was just like. It, it didn't really kind of phase me. And then, uh, you know, I just started going out and going around to clubs and everything. And that, that was August 1990 is when I uh, mm. first got up on stage. Hmm. Um, that's crazy. I look at how that's clubs... That's when I got... That's the first time I think I went up in Pips. Oh, in really? 89 or 90. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's funny. <laughs> I remember going up to Pips, you know, uh, when Wheels used to host and, and Dice that's, used to go on That's a lot, when I was around know? with Wheels yeah. and Dice and Vic and Otto and all those guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Damn, we must have performed together. You know what? I bet you we did. With Seth and Marty yeah. and those guys. Oh, they were, and they, you know, the shame about Shit, Seth. we must have fucking performed together. Man. I bet There's you we no did. No doubt about it. You that's know? crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's when comedy was, was, was wild. Did you have a set idea of like like the, the first time or second time you went up did you write everything out or did you just go off the top of your head or kind of both kind you of know both, what i mean right? early on i kind of just went up there i didn't really i was just telling stories and then eventually kind of you know started taking notes and recording stuff um and then but it, it was interesting because it, it it changed me very very quickly what i'm talking about is 
I would go to clubs because, you know, like I started working with my dad when I was eight years old. So I would just look at things from a business perspective. And I would go to these places, you know, outside the city and, and it'd be like, these clubs are run like shit. They treat us terribly. They treat the audience terribly. And I, and I just started thinking, I could do a better job. I could do a better job. I, you know, and that's... Simultaneously, while being a comedian, you're thinking the same thing. By the way, a huge advantage you have is that you didn't drink. Yeah. And that's no joke. No. It's a problem. It's a real fucking problem. You know, I drank heavily and and i was one of the lightweights and uh you know some of the guys that we both know that we've lost over they're dead I mean, they're, they're a lot you know i mean d- they i mean believe me i sat in this very club downstairs with greg giraldo and pleaded with him to get help he was a great guy he started out in the, in the original club you know and it's like he started it just, out with you yeah yeah it's like you know he started out in that club uh gaffigan at the same time um you know it, it, it's that's that's part of that fucking being a freak, that disease of being funny. It seems like sometimes it runs hand in hand with that self-destructive way of life that these guys can't shake. Yeah. You know, Otto. When you say G- Geraldo, I think of Otto. Otto oh, was I, like, let me tell you something. My Otto, brother, Otto. I mean, that guy could destroy a room. Destroy a room, unlike you know? and destroy the comedians in the room. My my buddies, I was telling you about. The college guys, we still quote his bits. All day long. A cock. Like, Billy will call me up and just, a cock, you know. Um, You know, that's who I broke in with. I broke in with him, Vic DiPoteto. I had Vic on the show recently. so Vic's a good guy. He's coming up. He's going to be your... uh, No, I should come and see him. I should come. He was on the show. We did a two-part episode. We had a great... But, I mean, not to veer off too much, but, um, you know, Geraldo, Otto... I don't want to drop a billion names, but there's a lot of comedians that, especially back in the day, was, it was all about coke and heroin. Not a lot of heroin, really. A lot of coke. A lot of coke and drinking. And, but that's, you know, you're not thinking about business. It was par for the course. You know? I mean, I, course. I was, you know, listen, I'm programmed a little oddly. So, I, yeah, I was thinking about business. You know, and I, it's funny. You're making me think now. I took, like, a class. And I remember the guy taught the class, said, look around you. These people that you you know you're sitting here with they're gonna be your friends for a long and he was right you know and it's like and I think about some of my hmm. buddies like I started out with um, a comedy class. They, this would be after the comedy class, but basically what the guy was saying is the people you start out with in this business are gonna be your friends. He's for gonna a long be your time, contemporary, you know? and like yeah. one of the guys you know that I because uh, I eventually took a job working at the New York Comedy Club. No, oh, Jesus, early nineties. Is that uh, by way of being a comedian looking for work or by way of a businessman looking to gain experience about the industry? It just kind of happened. Okay. Because what happened was, like, my normal instinct is, like, there were a few other guys running that, that room at the time, and uh, it wasn't um, the club at the, yet. And I kind of jumped in and would just help. And then eventually when the, when the room first opened, which it used to be on 2nd Avenue between 40th and 49th, over a bar called Olani's, the building's now demolished. But it was a famous nightclub called The Living Room. That Sinatra right. used to have Yes, it, that's you know? right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it is a famous. I, I would just like jump in and help, and then the guy said, "Hey, you know, do you want to like help us run this club?" And then eventually I became the manager of it, so it was good for me because I was running the club, but I also got to go on stage. You know, and, and how how early in your career did you start to realize? Was it instantaneous when you said these guys don't know how to run a club, they don't know how to treat people, they don't know what the fuck they're doing? For the most part, I, I saw that. Early. I mean, and it was like I can't. I'm not, not going to knock that place, but it was there were a lot well, no, of places. No, not that place yeah, in particular. Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, just, comedy in general was just it's a, it's a shit up, show. It's a shit show, man. You know, there's no question it about sucked. it. So <laughs> it, it, it was early on, and then um, I was going to mention that one of the guys I work with is a guy named Gary Greenberg, who's now like one of the head writers for Kimmel. You know, I mean, okay. and he's one of my dear. He's, he's a funny guy, great yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But That's a lot the of other guys benefit from, is having yeah. all these people and see where they wind up at this point because and, and, you've been with oh, it for yeah, so it's long. It's like, listen, I, I don't even, st- I still pinch myself that I, you know, this place exists, that I do what I do and make yeah. money doing it. It's just, it's It's nuts. fantastic. It really is amazing. Yeah. It's no, got to be, a, it's got to be like a, like, like sometimes like, uh, like going to a, a, like a Disneyland every day in a sense. Like it it's is. Like, a, it's, like, it's, a, it's, it's like, like, like I, I remember, park. you know, how this all came about was there was another guy who was doing stand-up at night. He was like a Wall Street guy, and we were kind of friendly, and uh, he happened to be dating a girl from my hometown. And uh, we hit it off. We were buddies, you know, and he's like, uh, he's like, what do you think about opening a comedy club? I go, I think about it all the time, basically, you know. And mm-hmm. he was getting like a Wall Street bonus, and we put some ideas together, and a couple of his bucks, and that's how the club started, you know. But I was remember you and a partner? Yeah. So is he still around, still yeah. a partner? Oh, yeah, and he actually does stand-up, and he's 
funny. Is he really? Yeah. So his his interest was not only financial, he was also a funny guy. Yeah. Yeah. What's his name? Mike Reisman. Right. And he's partners in the club? Yeah. It's so it's you, Mike, and your brother? For the most part. For the most part. Yeah. And what year was that? The conversation started like around ninety four. The club opened May tenth, ninety six. Gotham. Yeah. So open in the first place. Yeah. Opened in ninety six. Ninety six. So told, it was so so 21 years i was gonna say how do you so it's almost like it was almost like this sort of by default you slipped into the not slipped but you started working as a manager and then you know you were set up because you knew probably knew you were touring the circuit you were a comedian in your own right were you were, were you ever headlining at, at any point did you ever no, reach that I, point? I didn't get to that point i was only doing it like six years so i was just starting to kind of Get into a good groove there, you know. So, but but you also knew the mindset of these comedians. Was there ever any trepidation going into this business? Going, look, man, some of these guys are really fucking insane. I don't care who you know. You know, like, like I never worried about that. Never worried about it. No, no, so, and, and and every you know, it's like I, my kind of thinking was, I'm gonna open the best comedy club I can, mm-hmm. and train my staff to be great. Yeah, you know, and if it works, great. And if it doesn't, I'm not changing how I'm going to do things. Great. And I remember like having a conversation opening night with my partner saying, you know what, this thing's either going to hit big or it's going to fail miserably. Because it, it, it all depends on are people ready for, you know, hmm. like a higher end comedy club. I think it's a phenomenal concept and it's working. And, it, and yes, I think they were. And I think they yeah, still no, are. You know, you know. There's, a, there's always, always a certain amount of luck involved. You know, and look, I'm not going to tell you it was well, easy. You know, and it's, I'm thinking about what, what, what helped is because I understood the comedian side of the business and it was important to them. Like, I can't tell you how many nights Colin Quinn and I were in the old space when it was under construction trying to figure out how fucking high to make the stage, you mm-hmm. know, like it's standing on a milk crate, sure, you know? Sure, sure. And I walked around with a notebook for the better part of two years asking anybody who would talk to me about a comedy club what they liked about comedy clubs and what they didn't like, you What's know? What's the biggest complaint? Women hate dirty bathrooms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know? that makes so sense. it's like if you go downstairs down to the women's room, there's flowers down there. It's porcelain tiles. It's all clean stainless yeah. steel. You know, it's like that's funny. Yeah, but, but how do you? But, but they control who, like, you know, your wife is going to tell you. Don't tell your wife. They control you everything. They, so everything. It's, yeah. Right. Well, there and you also go. the crowd you're going for at this at, at Gotham is, you know, there are other clubs in town which are fine, great comedy clubs, but the crowd here, it's like you're going to come in for a night out. This yeah. Is your, no, you're going to get you can get dressed up. And, right. You know, you this can get is foreplay. Dre- right. You can get dressed up. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's. Yeah. But it's true. The women make the decisions Ab- in life. So, so that's first and foremost was the bathroom. How about spacing? Like sometimes it's a little too crowded in a, in a comedy this, club. You know, so that's a good point. You, there's a fine line. Like you don't want to be too spaced out like, because then it's, there's something about being on top of one mm-hmm. another, you know, and that laugh is kind of contagious. You right. want the room kind of packed but not too packed, mm-hmm. you know, so it's comfortable. It's hard. You know? right. And then you need your staff to get through. Yeah. So you can't have it too packed. No, 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 no. No, yeah, you're right. The design the... of the room is very fluid. <laughs> like, look at yeah. it. You see, the, it, you know, staff can, two people can well, go in and out. What I liked the... about this room, to get back to when I first looked at it, is that where we sit right now, there is nobody more than like 55 feet away. You know, if I put the stage on that wall, you'd have, you know, it, it just, <clears> it's this too is where this is perfect. it works. It's a central know? point. It's right. actually, believe it or not, it's for a 300 seat room, it's pretty intimate. What I, what, I was, what I was thinking about when I asked you about dealing with crazy comedians when you first opened it is, you know, because of that element, you don't know if somebody's going to be high as hell or not, forget to show up. And like, so how do you deal with about, that? You know, I don't. Yeah, and what I'm talking about is like, look, from being in the business, you pretty much know who's the solid guys, right? Yeah, so it's like I, I'm just, I, I, you know, I don't have time for that. You yeah, know? Nobody's going to have time for. You're not going to work long. No. No, because yeah. it's like, look, I'm running a business, you know, and it's like, and especially if we're booking out a show and comics, because they don't just do spots here, they do it in other clubs, mm-hmm. right? So if I tell you you have an 8 o'clock spot here and a, and a 1020, I got to run on time because you probably have a spot in between, you know, mm-hmm. and if I'm running late, you may not make that other spot. That's right. You know, and then, so for a comic, like, to show up late or to go over on time, it, it, it's it, screwing us, you're it's not screwing the other yeah. comics, so it's, I, I can't have that. Right. You know? It kind of whips comics into shape. Yeah. It whips them into shape in a sense. Like, See? listen, I'm going to respect you and, and I'm going to run the show on time and I'm going to pay you what I said I'm going to pay you, but you got to show up on time and do your lot of time and then, yeah. you know. And then you then that it weeds out the guys that aren't ready to be professionals. You know, it's funny because, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with comedians because I was one for a little bit. I, th- I still consider myself one. Without one, you know, without being on stage, I just see the world in a comedic, you know, through a comedic eye. But mm. um, being around those guys, like one of the worst things for me was that I would get depressed 
hanging out with these guys that were, had so many fucking crazy issues, like, you know, whether it was... But, you know, for every story, like, there are guys who don't have any, you know, it's... They're, you I know. know, maybe I should have got the fuck out of Brooklyn a little bit then. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> maybe it wasn't so good yeah. to hang out with Otto and those boys. But, but, I mean, look, and in the same time, they were the most brilliant minds on the planet, you know, yeah. like, like that... So, so being around it, but I'm thinking about from a business standpoint, my first thing would be like, fuck, these guys are crazy. My whole business is built on the, the backs of insane people, right? It, it, listen, you know what it is? It, it's, it's like going to a fine dining restaurant, right? You know, you could take any country bumpkin and put them in it, and they know they're in a nice place, and they're going to behave a certain way, right? Yeah. They adjust to the atmosphere. You know, Definitely. If, you know, if you walk into a place and there's sawdust on the floor and, you know, yeah. Busted, you know, beer bottles, you know, <laughs> and the bathrooms think like piss. You're going to behave a certain way. That's right. You know, it's like yep. you, if they don't give a shit, why should you give a shit? Yeah. But if the place right. cares, then you right. go, hey, you know what? I got to behave here. That makes sense to me. The first, the first few years and the money, did we? Was it easy going at the beginning? Was it surprisingly easy? Or was it? <laughs> it was as brutal. Hard as, it was brutal. I didn't make any money. Didn't make anything. No. For how long? I made zero the first year. For a year. And I went into debt, a lot of debt. Yeah. And I didn't. I don't think I even started making money in. I think it was like the 18 months in, I started making a little bit of money. Really? Started taking it, yeah. And you went into yeah. Manhattan type of debt. That's not regular debt. <laughs> like, no, it was serious debt. When you say debt, debt it's, yeah. uh, and especially, you know, a comedy, a, comedy, um, a comedy club is a restaurant, essentially, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, for the most it's part. It's kind of a... Um, kind of. It's like a hybrid. drinking establishment with entertainment. It's a bar, restaurant, yeah. right, type of thing. So you, you're talking about like, you know... The fucking staff and yeah and, and right from a customer yeah. experience then you have all those little aspects that you have to get right you have to get the food right you have to get drinks out fast because yeah. that's bread and butter well, that, and that, let me tell you something that's like the, like there's a bar there behind that wall there's a bar uh, there behind that wall you know the servers here have handhelds as they're taking the order it's printing out by the bar so oh, it's already fun. made oh that's amazing so it's, it's you Good know idea. you've got a certain amount of time to get and even like every item on that food menu is all done with knowing how quick we can get it out you know that's now that, that's nowadays that's, that's, what, that's the level you've reached right now well because you have to because you, you know to. We live in the everybody wants everything now generation. Yeah, sure. You know, and you got to realize, unlike a restaurant, you know, if we were a restaurant, you know, you have a seven o'clock reservation, you have a seven fifteen, you have a seven thirty, you have a seven forty, you have an eight. Here, everybody sits down at the same time and wants food and drink now. That's right. So on a, on a night where we're slammed, we see three hundred people in fifteen minutes. Oh fuck, that's something I never so considered. You're completely slammed. Wow. You know? So it's like we like on a night like that, we'll have. Two bartenders, two bar backs, Damn. ten servers, runners. That's what I was going to say. How many hosts. servers do you have? Ten? Ten. Ten servers, ten... ten two, bartenders, two bartenders, two, two bar backs, Damn. six, six hosts, fly. plus runners, <clears throat> you know? So it's like, you got to really, you know, yeah. because you're going to put out at a minimum on a show like that, you know, if everybody just gets two drinks, that's 600 drinks plus food. That's right. And an hour and 45 minutes. Quietly, while the act is going on. Right. <laughs> And unobtrusively. And drop checks and collect money, oh, you know, and turn them in for the next show. That's, you know? so and it's then, like, that's tough. That's insane. That's, tough. that's insane. So I could see how you would fail. Yeah. And, you know. So that's just taking care of the customer experience. And then you also have to worry about booking right. and get talent. Booking. Right. And get the right people in here that want to play a brand new club. That's right. And have never been here before. And they don't know what type of people you're bringing in. And so, I imagine so, some of these yeah. talents, like, I'm not playing your place. Was it the guys you were most comfortable with when you first started? Was it the Colin Quinns of the world and those guys? That, are you really tight with Colin? Yeah, yeah I've known Colin a long yeah, time. He's I a great mean, guy. So wh- who, wh- who were the first guys? Was it, like, who were the first headliners at, at Gotham? So the club didn't start as a headliner club. It was a showcase club. Showcase. And uh, opening What's night. What's the difference? So showcases you're featuring on a weekend show or during the week, like five or six, you know, comics okay. all doing the same amount of time a headliner is you're featuring one name that's going to do like an hour and they'll have two or three openers now the cool thing about seeing a headliner in new york is the talent pool is so strong that the opening acts could be on par with the headliners. they could part. be headliners right you know what i mean that's so right. it's it, it, it it's a cool thing but opening night was with actually it was a magical night um we had Mike Royce hosted the show and Mike actually went on to be a showrunner uh on an um executive producer uh, on Everybody Loves Raymond, and he's done a bunch of other series since that. It's awesome. It was... Uh, I Paul, love that type of stuff. Yeah, Paul Provenza. Paul's a fucking legendary right. comedian. Sarah Silverman. 
Another one. I love Sarah Silverman. And I have Chappelle. a very big crush on her. You Mike do? Rick. She's Jewish, though. I love her. You sure? Right. She's right. insanely right. sexy and beautiful. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. To me. But and Mike Ricca hates when I say that because he doesn't like Sarah. But and whatever. then uh, Chappelle headlined. That's <laughs> fucking incredible. What year was that? 96. 96. Wow. Oh, come on, man. Yeah, that's the show you want to be at. Come on, man. I mean, I remember you called me and I couldn't make it. Yeah, well, and, um, <laughs> you and had that I, commitment uh, thing. Yeah, I had the. I was busy. That with thing. A lot of stuff. Well, you know what it is. You're a good dad, and you were coaching the kids' little right, league. Right. I mean, they weren't born yet. But yeah, yes, but yes, yes, you were coaching other kids' little league. Preparing to be a dad. Well, the next one. And uh, <laughs> the next one. Um, so, how did you feel the first night, man? How was it? Was it was, it, was it an elation? You know what? It took so long to get to that point that the club actually opened. It, it there was a sense of relief. You know, and then the next morning I woke up and I'm like, oh, man, we got to rock and roll. Shit we again. got to make this and again, happen. And again. You know? But, like, oddly enough, like, you know, even coming down here today, it's like, you know, I'm excited to come to work every day. Yeah. I mean, go ahead, Chad. Do you want to ask him something? No, no. I mean, yeah, that's the key. If you don't love it, don't do it. I mean, or at least if you're loving it, you're going to be more successful at it than, you know, if you're just going through the motions. Yeah. And, you, you know, like, listen, we, there's a certain amount of luck with everything, too. It's just it's certain things that... You know, early on in the club's life, uh, Seinfeld stumbled on the club, and it, you know it, it helped a lot because well, it was a lot of there Jerry was, a lot, was yeah, there was a lot of press that you know because his show was was winding down. And even like how that all came about, it was a funny story because the old club, uh, I would come in, you know, because I was, at that time I was working like late at night, two, three o'clock in the morning. You know, I get in the club in the afternoon, and we had this hostess who's actually a very funny comedian now, Jody Watserman. Um, yeah, Jody she's kinda, Watchman. Well, yeah. So yep. she's kind of like a, you know, she's kind of like a tough girl. Mm-hmm. So she used to take like this is before I had voicemail. Another so she, very sexy, beautiful woman. You seeing a trend here, Chad, with me? Yeah, you like Go the ahead. Jewish. Woman. So, so Smart, Jody Jewish would just woman. take down, you know, like handwritten messages for me. So I'd walk in and I said, you know, who called today? And she'd be like, oh, this guy called this guy. And that particular day, she's like, and yeah, and some stupid comic pretending to be Jerry Seinfeld called. And I said, well, I know it wasn't Jerry Seinfeld. She said, like, I could tell. I said, well, what do you say? <laughs> He, she Jody, said, give me the fucking right, number, will you, please? Yeah. <laughs> she, she, she said, he said, what shows do you have tonight? Can I come in and do a spot? That's not a fake fucking call. No. That's, so, <laughs> so she that's said, a comedian So calling. I said, well, what'd you say to him? And she said, I told him, yeah, you and all the other Jerry Seinfelds, and I hung up the phone on him. So he must have laughed. So He probably gets that all the time. She's like, but it definitely wasn't him. So I went downstairs, and I called Colin. And I said, Colin, I know you're tight with Jerry. I said, can you, I said, can you find out and see if you called the club? Because... A host said some comic called and said he was Jerry, but I don't. I think it was Jerry. This is know? like a bad romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. So the plot line of every bad movie on Oxygen. You know, I, I call Colin. He calls me. Calls me out. And he goes, "It's him. He's coming." And I'm like, hey, "Jerry Seinfeld." So, right. so, yeah. so I walk up to Jody. I go, "Really?" I go, "Was it Jerry Seinfeld?" I go, "It was him, and he's coming tonight." <laughs> <Fuck> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's so my I, uh, Colin Quinn imitation. By yeah, the way, I remember. <laughs> that came it. in. It was a Tuesday night. You know, and came in uh, on Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday night, and you know he's been coming ever since. Did he, he just called up? He must have. Did, did he? Did he? Did you t- talk to him after? About, after about? Did he scout the club first, or did he just say, "Hey, there's this new place. I want to go check it out." You know, I, don't, I know Dave Chappelle knows him too. Like, yeah, you maybe. know what? That's it's. Good. I never asked him that. I have a. I suspect it might might have been Colin, or maybe he just heard about it because the club when he came in, I think it was like ninety eight or ninety. It's a club that had a couple of years under its belt. So the first big name that came in was, and he was another Pips guy, was David Brenner. Yeah, David Brenner. You know, he was. I, I David Brenner him. was one of the greatest people ever born. I, I, I let me tell you something. When he passed, I was devastated. He was yeah. such a good guy. I actually have voicemails saved from him. Really, He's a dear friend. I, I, I love David. But yeah, he was phenomenal to me. Yeah. The same way he yeah. was a. Beautiful, Gentle soul, beautiful, yes. good, good man, good, yep, good man, great story. That's the other end stories. of the spectrum of you know, the type of guy you'll find the pitch the, is a guy like him. <laughs> the sad thing about it is that we and him had a book in development Did about really? his Vegas Fuck. days. Oh, he had great stories Dude, about the mob. His Vegas days were unbelievable. How about he was making 175 grand a week in the 70s? In the 70s. In the, yeah. He was the first bigger name, you know, big name to come in yeah. to the club. And then he told Robin Williams about it. Robin started coming down. So, like, they, that was kind of like when they started going to a cool place. And then, like, Robert Klein started coming down. Then Carlin started coming down. Carlin. You know, and now they're like... George it, Carlin like, came, it, came it, to the Gotham Comedy Club? Yeah, it was crazy because, like, those guys would call me and say, is it okay if I come down? I'm like, 
And I used to say to him, don't call, just come. You, That's right. Do George Carlin. Come down yeah. anytime you want. Thanks. You know? I think you yeah. created the bump. You know, yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. Chris. Yeah. <laughs> you created the bump. Yeah. Like from a comedian's mind, that means you're getting bumped. If George Carlin walks in, you're getting bumped. Yeah, it's like, right? you, you could, you know, <laughs> anytime you want to come down of here. Course. But even like, you know, I mean, then, first of all, just not from a comedian, from being a, a comedian and a fan of comedy, you're going to say that. And being a business owner, it's a no brainer. Come down. And they were nice. I mean, even like you know, there were times that, uh, Robin came in, and, and usually, you know, he would come in, and he was, you know, like, he was such a big personality, but as a human being, he was not, not a very big guy in stature, right. you know? And, and he's not always on. Right. Oh, he, no, he was not on at all. Right, so he's not he, always he, that guy. He would come in, and we would hang out at the old club in the front and sit down and talk, and then he would go on stage. And, like, one night we were, like, talking for, like, an hour and a half, and I'm like, Robin, I go, uh, yeah, I'm sorry we've been talking so long. I said, do you want to go on? And he's like, no. He goes, I just came to talk to you and say you were doing it. I just wanted oh, to check in, you know? Great, I man. mean, just such a such a... A good guy. See that that's the type of stuff that breaks my heart, man. <laughs> you, wow. see, you hear stuff like that and then those guys are gone now. Yeah. You know? They, what, yeah. what, what, when, when they came and they guys like that come to a place, you know, they'll come here specifically to work out material or just to stay sharp, or is it both? Is it both. It's both. Both. Right? You know, and it's uh I mean you make me think there was one night Robert Klein was doing a run at the club. He was doing Wednesday nights for like a long time. And he was working on a new HBO special. Fucking genius. So, yeah. They're all so geniuses. Seinfeld yeah. loved him, you know, and was a big fan. So mm -hmm. he said, hey, I want, I want to come in tonight. And, and uh, he came in, and Carlin was in the crowd. So Robin, I mean, um, Carlin, <laughs> what? Robert, and Seinfeld. I, I'm trying to think the Carlin one that night. I'm not sure if uh, two of them went on or three of them went on, but then afterwards they all came out to the bar and the show had ended and they were talking and the whole audience came out and were around them, you know, and they were talking shop as if nobody was around them. You they know, they, they, were, they, they were, were used to people gawking at them. Yeah, the they, did, so they, they didn't, didn't even phase them. In, in, yeah, didn't phase them They were talking all. shop. Right. Carlin, Seinfeld, Klein. and Klein. Do you remember the conversation? Go ahead. Okay. It was, just, it it was everything from where you work now, what are you working on, to, to the craft. This was great. That bit, you know. <laughs> I'm going to do the garden next week, and I'm thinking about doing an HBO special, right? And I remember, like, there was a woman, and she was kind of breathing weird, you know. And I said, are you okay? And she says, I'm from Ohio. Things like this don't happen. <laughs> she was hyperventilating, you know. <laughs> Oh, that's the other thing, man. You know, when you explain that to me, like if I'm the guy who owns the club and uh, Robert Klein is here and Carlin and Seinfeld are in the audience and like they're in the club, I, I, I might have somebody slam a door into my face. Like that's how insane for it. Like as a fan of comedy, the only thing that makes that better is if like Richard Pryor showed up. Like I don't know yeah. how do you how do you get better? You know, than and those don't. those moments, it's like it's to this day and, and doing it a long time. You know, like when things like that happen. And like, look, I still like when Seinfeld comes in or Chappelle or uh, George Kevin Wallace. Hart, I you saw know. here a couple yeah, times. Yeah, Wallace is a great guy. I love Wallace. Wallace you know? is a raging genius. Yeah, another well, guy. They're all so amazing to me. Another, and he's such a he's another sweetheart of a man. Yeah, but it's like. When those guys, I still get chills. Like when, they, when you still because, do. That's what I was because you know ask what you, the, the crowd like they don't expect it. You know, and, and we had a, a, a night not too long ago where Jerry came in. You know, and he brought he w did time, and then he brought on Chappelle, and the crowd like they couldn't breathe. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, you know, it's like the, people were losing their shit. You're talking about you know? legends, yeah. you know, but you, you also have come from a beneficial place in the sense that you watched Chappelle grow and become the guy he is oh, now, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's that element of it. Like, yeah, listen, I knew you when, but you're still... I love the idea that you still love the moment. Oh, you know, that moment is still fucking electric. Oh, it's crazy. Like, I was wondering if there's, a, if there's ever a time when you become cynical about it or it gets old hat and... Hasn't and I think happened you, yet. I, I, I was going to say, you kind of answered that question. Do you... Do you, Are there guys that you see immediately and you think, all right, that could be... That guy can be... A Seinfeld or a Chappelle, he has the oh yeah uh, uh, younger uh, part, guys. Yeah, one hundred percent. So seven years ago, my brother and I were at Montreal Comedy Festival, and Steve Byrne, who started out of this club, is a great guy, good friend. Uh, headlines here for us said, "You should meet this guy, Sebastian Maniscalco." And I said, "Oh yeah," I said, I I've seen him on on TV, you know, and I thought he was great, you mm -hmm. know. So we met, and I booked him to do a weekend here at the club, and uh, it was his first time head headlining here. It was Friday night. Mm -hmm. I was standing over there. And he comes out, and he does an hour. And I was like, 
this guy's going to be a superstar. And why isn't he a superstar right now? This guy's, Really? I was like, this guy's one of the best I've ever seen. I watched his second show, and the hour was different than the first hour. And I call my brother, Stephen, and I'm like, you got to get down here tomorrow. we got to sign this guy. I, I, this guy is going to be the you next gotta big thing. you got to sign this guy. Were you in management at that time? Yeah, just brand new. I, did, you, I, I so think I had, like, well, I, I had like one or two clients, and Amy Schumer was one of them. So Amy was one of your first two clients? Yeah. What, why? Why did you get into so, management? Is it just because of that, those moments where you said, yeah, what the fuck drives you? Because that's you know, amazing I, I, to, um, to be able to, to, to do those things, you know? So for, I want to make sure the club was like running the way I wanted to run and that I had time to dedicate yeah, you're to a being. a fucking genius. So that, that yeah. well, I don't know about that. Yeah, but yeah I, you're I, a business genius. I, you know ahead. what? I work hard. And, yeah, and, 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 that's and, being and I love what I do. Right. So, so it's like uh, Steve came down. He, we watched the bash on a Saturday. And, you know, at the time he was represented by somebody else. And I said, look. I'm not a poacher. I don't operate that way. If ever comes a time we're not happy with your managers, I'd love to talk to you. And that's how it all started. And it's like, and that guy, I was like, this guy is going to be a superstar. How long did it take before he called you and said, I'm not happy with my managers. Let's talk. It was quick. It was quick. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Why? Did he say why he wanted to? Just because he was unhappy with his manager? Like, what makes him choose you as well? I think I, think I, I know the answer, but, you, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. As a comic, when you come into a room that's well run and organized, mm -hmm. you know, if the guys or guy, guys that are running that room are running that room, you kind of would think, well, if they're running the club yeah. the right way, they could probably run a creep. It's know? almost so, like w without trying, it's, I don't want to call it an audition, but it was kind of like showing him what, you, what you're about. So, you know, it just, it was a great match. And, um, you and know, we work with a company called Levity Entertainment Group, my brother and I. And, you know, we bring Sebastian in, and, you know, like right away we were off. The, I mean, it, it didn't happen overnight because I remember like early on I was calling clubs arguing to get him like go from 2000 to 2500 bucks. Now the guy's playing, you know, huge rooms. You yeah, know? he is. I mean, he's world famous almost. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, but, but, but here's the thing. Before I forget, I'm sorry. That first night when he killed it like that, he did the hour and then he did another. What? It's never one joke. It's never one thing. It's oh, it's got to be for you the whole package. I mean, you've seen so many comedians come and go, and, and like, is it the idea that he never stopped the way he addresses the crowd? Is it eye contact? Like, what is the, what is it? Is it's it all a combination of, that? of things? It, yeah, and yeah, yes, it is all of that. Yeah, you know, but it's like I just saw something in him, and really, he's a great writer and a great storyteller. You know, and especially being Italian, it was stuff that I connected to. You know, but more importantly. Listen, if, if that guy stood on stage upright and held the mic in his hand and told his jokes, he'd be a fantastic comedian. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he has that physicality and those little moves that he does, yeah. people are already dying laughing, and he throws like, you know, a hand movement or kicks his leg up, and mm. then they go into hyper, you know, dry. It's, it's the exclamation right. point. So it's, it's the thing, you know, the extra. He's, just, he's got a lot going on there, you know, and he's, just, he's, he's, a, he's, a, a he's brilliant guy. You know, he's inherently he's, funny. He's a and funny you know what? human he's, being. I'll tell you, we talked about like the Italian thing and the work ethic. He's got the, he, he grew up in a very similar household. Mm -hmm. His Dad and mom had a work ethic. It was instilled in him, you know, and you know it shows. Like that guy is, you know, he's not worried about what he's doing now. He's worried about, you know, what's the next thing. You know, it's uh, he just he's, he's he's special. And then that he really is. So, all right. So you go back to the. So now you're managing him, and now your thing is you have to get him exposure. Is that is that what a manager does essentially? You know, it's the manager is kind of like the quarterback of everything, you know. So it's like we're kind of big picture, you know, overseeing and working hand in hand with the agent, you know, and setting like I remember we sat down with him downstairs in the lounge and figured out, okay, you know, I want to know what his goals were, what was important to him, you know, and, and that's our job to help him achieve those goals. Yeah, what does a guy say? I want to be famous. I want to be successful in this business. I well, want but to you know, make but, a but, living so, at this. I want so to let's define success. Like, right. success to some people is I want to headline certain club, you know, or I want to get to theaters. Or I just want to be a club comic or a headlining comic. That's all I want to do. Success to others, I want to do stand-up to get into acting is where I really, where my heart really lies yeah. is I want to have my own sitcom. Or I want to do stand-up to get into writing. I want to write for Jimmy Kimmel, you know. So yeah. it's like, what's the goal? Yeah, what is success you know? to you? What is it? So Literally, what Once I know right. that, you know, and it's like, you'd be surprised. There are plenty of people who don't know that yet. And it's like, when you know what those goals are, it's a lot <laughs> easier to yeah. achieve, to attain those goals when you know what they are, you that's know. That's right. And that's where we step in. It's like, because that's what we're really good at, you know. We have all the contacts. And, you know, like, we have... Baby clients, like I can tell you, there's a kid that we represent named Leonard Utz, who's 24 years old, who it's already happening for him. You know, he's on Wild and Out and uh, another series called Safe Word, and he's got some movie roles coming out. 
you know, it was the same thing with him. Like, it, it's you just know. Well, I don't know. For me, you just know. You and, just knew. Yeah. That's like he, a talent he, submi- in and of he submitted a tape for the TV series. And I, again, grabbed my brother and said, hey, look, I said, Steve, this, if this kid can deliver the way he's delivering on this tape on the TV show, we got, we got to sign up. Really? And Leonard Utz, how do you spell his last name? O U Z T S. Oh, that's great. Um, and he's just, you know, he came and did the TV show. He crushed it that night. And we literally, he came off stage. We sat down and said, look, we want to sign you. That speaks to, like, your desire to create. I think that's what drives you a little bit, I, I sense. I sense the, I, that you might be driven by the creation, you know, to create the process, like, to, to look back and go, wow, look where Sebastian is now. And not, that, not that, I mean, you, had a, you played a big role in it. I mean, obviously his talent and what he does led to it, obviously, but we glossed right over Amy Schumer. I did. Anyway, like, you're Amy Schumer's fucking manager, right? Well, so, not anymore. I was. But you were, but you helped yeah. her get to where she is, in a sense. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, I, I'd like to think I played a part in anybody I represented, you know, and uh, there's a team of people, you know, mm-hmm. myself, like with Sebastian, it's, you know, me, Steve, uh, Judy Brown, my on the, on the West Coast, you know, and then his agents. But it's the same thing with other, you know, but with, with the one thing I'll say about Amy is like, I she actually mentioned something in a book about it, but I was like the first person to say to her, hey, look, you have something special. Yeah. You know, you, and she did, and she does. Yep. You know I mean? You know, she's a Very sexy, intelligent, oh, beautiful woman. Yeah, she's, you know. See she's, what I'm saying, she, Chad? She's a, she's a talented kid, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know. I'm going to keep my sister friends. away from you. I'm just, <laughs> your effects with, with Jewish the Jewish women gals, yeah. Scaring yeah. me. Eh, it's beautiful. No, but she, she's, you know. When did you know Sebastian was going to take off? Like, I know you knew inherently, but what, what was the one thing? Was it an HBO special? Was it a... You know, his specials were great. Uh, you know, it's, um, I got to tell you, honestly, with him, I knew the first night I saw him. Like, I just, it just it was a matter of when. And it's right. happening, like, you know, this guy's selling tickets. Like, he broke the record in, at the Borgata. He sold out seven shows there. Nobody's sold out seven shows oh, there. That's incredible, you know, it's man. like, we have dates coming up. I think we're going to do them, uh, Radio City this, this upcoming spring. You know, I mean, he just did the uh, theater at Mohegan, Mohegan Sun, 10,000 200 seats there, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. So that's what it is for him? Is it is it the big venues right now? Is that what he's focusing on? Is he you know, the type he of guy actually, wants to do sitcoms and stuff like that? You know, or? like, he, he had a sitcom that didn't go last year. I mean, he loves doing stand-up, and he's a great stand-up. And, I mean, the kind of sweet spot for him is, like, those 3,000-seat theaters, but sometimes it just doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, there's not one that works right um i think it, it you know if he had his choice that would is what he would play but sometimes in some markets you can't and the other thing too is like if you go into a market you can sell twenty thousand tickets you really want to do seven shows you know <laughs> right it's you know it's a lot right, it's you a know? lot he's got, he's got a new new daughter now adorable little kid serafina she's where is it uh, he lived does he is his home base on the east coast he's chicago originally but now la He's a Chicago guy, right? Yeah. So, so why do you think that is? More comedians, I mean, aren't necessarily going to TV or film, and they're kind of just working the rooms and working. Well, listen, there's a lot of money in touring. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's I, I, a lot I, of money in it nowadays, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those college tours must pay great. College pays good. Yeah, yeah. You know. No, because I mean, you look, you had Jerry who went to television, Kevin James, and Ray, and you had all these guys who went to TV and like got huge contracts and you know the highest paid people at their time, and then. You don't have that necessarily, or at least I'm not seeing it as See, much. Well, you know, it's because TV's, you think about how much the TV landscape has changed in 20, 25 years, you know, how many more challenges are. So mm. it's like people are, I mean, not that people aren't getting paid in TV, they are, but not the way they used to. And the laws have changed on, on how much you, uh, um, a production company can own of a TV show, which means that they can't give out ownership the way they used to give out ownership to the talent on the show. So it's. Right. Oh, it's a whole different landscape out there now. Yeah. Do you, uh, you do any producing? You did some producing in the, in the past. Films, documentaries, anything like that? Yeah, you know what? We, we, did this, we produced a series that we did here, you know, some of Sebastian's stuff. We got our hands in a, in a couple other projects right now that we produce on. Yeah. You know, you yeah. talk about it or no? You don't want to. Is it under wraps? As yeah, you know what I mean? T- honestly, for me, like I'm old school. I don't have to jinx anything until right. it's like actually yeah. filmed and cu- you know. But didn't you until it's on the air? <laughs> yeah, right. And other yeah. people are watching. The che- I'm the same way <laughs> yeah. with any product <laughs> until it's out there in the distribution. Yeah. It doesn't exist. And the checks are cleared. And exactly. It's fucking a success. Ah, yep. Um, the cars, cars. You're a car guy. What the? F- um, what the? <laughs> like, how much so, time do you have? 
and, and, and like the five day. more minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, do you have five more minutes? Yeah. All right. Give me, give me five minutes into why you were a car guy. And by the way, yeah. with five minutes left, maybe I can persuade you. Maybe we'll do a part two. We'll come and do a collaboration. Oh yeah. Listen, I, I, is it collaborate I could talk or collaborate, for collaborate days. Chad? Chad's collaborate. my collaborate. He's my educated. Collaborate, he's yes. my educated friend. So mm-hmm. the the car thing. My dad. Um, Worked for Chevrolet in the late 50s, early 60s in the parts department as a kid. You know, he was mm-hmm. a street racer. He had a 58 Bel Air, then a 58 Impala. And, you know, I grew up around cars. You loved them. Uh, You're a car I guy. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I, I was always partial to GM and Chevrolet in particular, but I love all cars now. You know, since I like high school when you first started driving? Yeah, oh, even before even that. Before. Yeah, I started drawing cars as a little kid. I have pictures when I was like a, you know, teeny, like with models really? and tinkering with cars, you know, and it was just, you know, as far back as I can remember, I always knew, like, when I have money, I want to buy a Corvette, you know. And um, <laughs> It's always the Corvette, our age group. Yeah. It's the Corvette. Yeah. Right? And I just, you know, I mean, to me, they're like works of art, works of art, you know. And, uh, you know, I started collecting, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And collecting. What do you do? What's the first collector car that you get? Because, by the way, I'm the opposite of what you just explained as me. I am, I'm the guy at the party, like, I have a cousin who's like you. His name is Chip. Whenever I go to one of his gatherings, I'm always, like, I'm always the third guy in the conversation when the other guy walks up and goes, did you see they came out with the Z1561A365 with the, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the guy looks at me and I go, yeah, um, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that, that one is a fast one, too, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I always feel less manly yeah, than guys I'm, like you. No, nah, I mean, it's, 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 it's like, I'm sure you don't play about sports facts, and fit, you know? Yeah, so it's sure. like, we all have our things. And, you know, like when it comes to some of that stuff, you know, I, especially with Corvettes, I know a lot of facts and figures and production and this and that. Um, Although I will say, if I ever was at a car show or surrounded by cars with a guy like you, I can get interested. Like I know you would capture my, I would know I would, I would find would, it interesting. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it is. You know, it's like, and look, people like invest in the stock market. I don't even want to say like, I, I buy cars because I like them and I have fun with them. You, you know? love them. It's like, yeah. uh, you know, I like to drive them. I like to, you know, tinker with them. You know, What's your favorite car? Is it, is it still a vet? Well, yeah, kind of my all-time favorite. They only made two of them, a 69 Corvette ZL1. What's the difference between that and the ZL other one? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> ZL1 was an all-aluminum block 427. Oh, of course, and, uh, Feel aluminum block. It's worth like yeah. 4 million bucks. It's worth 4 million. Yeah. Who has it, Jerry? <laughs> no, actually, the, and uh, Jerry's actually seen it. I showed him a picture of it. But uh, a guy named that, that has one of them is named Roger Jutsky. He lives down in Florida. He's had it for years. He bought it. Actually, a drug dealer had it, and he bought it in the 80s. I think he paid like 300000 for it back then. Well, who decides that it's worth $4 million? The market? Like the yeah. stocks? Yeah. Is that how that goes? Yeah. So somebody is willing to pay him $4 million for that. Like a well, stock, like the ask. I don't know if they, you know, they're willing, but that, that's really I mean, That's really what it's worth. Yeah. So... Th- you also did seven seasons of a car show? No. It was seven seasons of Gotham. Yeah. The car show. You did a I, car show. I did do. I did uh, an online series at Yahoo with Michelle Rodriguez called uh, Riding Shotgun with Michelle Rodriguez. So Riding Shotgun with Michelle Rodriguez, who was in the Fast, Fast and, and Furious, Furious. Uh, movies. Cool chick. She's a she's really, really yeah. good actress and yeah, very, yeah. very sexy. Yeah, she's, she's funny, too. She's, she's, she's a good kid. She yeah, but a it was a huge um, crush on me. I'm married. <laughs> and it's a problem. Yeah, no, I but know. I've been trying to work running interference it. for you for a while Thank on that you. one. I appreciate yeah, well, that's that. the least I can do as your single friend. But listen to what he does as a throwaway. This is why I'm a Christmas Illy fan. Yeah. Like, by the way, I also did a, a TV series with one of the hottest women on the planet yeah. about cars. That was fun. Yeah, of course it was <laughs> of fun. Of <course> was. <laughs> doing a the, show about what, cars with what, gorgeous women. Yeah, what's like, the name of it? What was the name of it? It's called Riding Shotgun. With Riding Shotgun. Shotgun. It's okay. called This Show Can't Be Bad. <laughs> this show, and it's, by the way, it's not bad. See, I watched this a few episodes. That's what I mean. She's sexy and absolutely the cars beautiful. Were cool. So, yeah, so basically. But she's smart and knowledgeable, and you guys. Yeah, cars yeah, we, were, that, that, yeah. I was kind of like her go to car guy, and, you know, we would pick out these cars, and she drove them around the track at speed, and. Yeah, she was, you know, it's a great really, idea. She's a good driver, you know. Do you, uh, you still, do you still want, you know, do it anymore with her? Is it, is it? No, you know, it was because Yahoo kind of went through a big transitional period. Mm-hmm. So the funny thing is, they, they were like all gung ho with it, and then they kind of just put it out. There. They didn't release it the right way. I mean, it was a lot of work went into that. And the production company that we did it with, Matador, who were the great guys over there, 
you know, a lot of time and effort went into it. You know, it was, they put, it was a big budget thing for yeah, Armani. It you know? was. It was really well I mean, done. It's, I mean, as you look at the way that <clears throat> shot, you know, I mean. It's insane. Yeah. Really well done. Listen, I know you got to go. And I, yeah. I could stay here for hours with you. Well, Literally, we'll I could really stay here for hours. Yeah, well, let's definitely. Thank you for your time, Chris. Oh, no. My and pleasure. Thank you. Gotham Comedy is located on? 23rd and 7th. 23rd 208, and 7th. 208 West 23rd. <laughs> right next to the historic Chelsea Hotel. Um, That's right. Which is actually a really interesting site as well. True. So you get them both it's in. It's uh, Gotham Comedy Gotham Club. Comedy Club. Com. And uh, next time, we'll have uh, a few of our friends on. We're going to have Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, much funnier Dave people Chappelle, than me sitting here. And Michelle Rodriguez. Listen, if and, you could book them, I'm, I'm down. Let's no, do that's it. That's what I was asking you to do. That's what I was saying. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> they, they won't even go into a room with me. But I appreciate so you coming on. Though. Okay. Yeah. We'll see you next yeah. time, buddy. Thanks, Chris Mazzilli, yeah. goddamn legend. Thank you for joining us. To stay up to date on all things 3PLT, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter so you'll always know when our latest episodes are up. For the complete 3PLT experience, please visit our DigiBro at 3PeopleLikeThis.com, powered by FreedomsDesign.com. For all your online business digital solutions, creating marketing assets and digital tools for companies who are ready to invest in themselves, freedomsdesign.com. Wow, your audience. Bro, it's DigiBro, bro. See you next time on 3 People Like This, because life is content.